very good morning to, to everybody. Let's say that we are uh, running a bit uh, late because we are waiting uh, the keynote address uh, speaker, uh, Josef Aschbacher from uh, European Space Agency. He is on his way, so it's, um, we will have to wait uh, one or two more, more minutes. But this gives me the time to mention to you that we will have an, uh, three questions for the audience. Uh, then the Slido tool. So my suggestion would be, or my recommendation would be, that if you take a look at the QR code, and um, and there you will be directed then to the polls uh, for these three questions. And we would really love to have your uh, your uh, answers on these three questions. They will be uh, projected on the screen um, at the at the uh, uh, let's say the second half of the of the panel session. Uh, so then we can see exactly, let's say, what is your what is your um, um, uh, uh, considerations for these for these three questions? So uh, uh, let me uh, introduce the uh, let's say the panel in anticipation of um, the arrival of uh, Josef Aspacher. So on my left side is um, is Christian uh, Hockley Hansen. He is the Director General of the Norwegian Space Agency, and also what is very important, he is our host to this uh, to this meeting. So let's say this is very uh, very important, and let's say Christian will talk later on. Let's say why what, why this uh, EIC, IAC uh, GNF is taking place today in anticipation of a bigger event, of an also a big event next year. Next to uh, Christian is uh, Pilar Zamora Acevedo. She is the Executive Director of the Colombian Space Agency. Then we have Rodrigo da Costa, uh, who is the executive, uh, executive director of the European Union Agency for, uh, for Space Programs, the USPA. There, next to uh, Rodrigo, we've got uh, Val. Val Monsame is the chancellor of the International uh, Space University and also now the advisor to the Saudi Space Commission. Then we have, next to Val, we've got uh, Masami uh, Onada, who is the director of the JAXA office in Washington, but she is also here in her capacity as chair of the Clyadin uh, Committee. And let's say this the Committee for the Liaison of International Organizations with Developing Nations. And uh, I have on the far left, uh, for me, for you the far right, it is uh, Yolanda van Eindhoven, uh, who is the head of unit of uh, the DGDFIS uh, International Relations and Communications uh, in Brussels. Uh, so we will have the, I don't know whether Joseph has arrived. Right Joseph has arrived. Oh, let's say that, that's the perfect timing, Joseph. Thank you very much that you have found the time to, to join us, uh, let's say, in this important panel session. And we're looking forward to your, to your keynote address. Thank you very much. So thank you, thank you for the introduction and I was just literally running in and uh, making sure that I'm here on time uh, on this session. So this is really uh, a very important topic on uh, emerging countries and sustainability uh, issues which is uh, at the heart of uh, many of the uh, applications we do from space and showing how space can be helpful in, in, in these uh, activities. But let me first thank uh, Christian for organizing this panel and uh, really making sure that uh, this topic is being addressed at this level. And I'm also very happy to see so many familiar faces uh, on, on this panel and I'm looking forward to the, uh, the discussion, which I'm sure is extremely interesting. Sust sustainability, as, as you all know, is a, is a key topic uh, for all of us uh, in space and, of course, uh, also outside the space domain. And spa space activities are really carried out in, in support of, uh, of high-level uh, political objectives, and one of them is, uh, of course, constituted through the United Nations Sustainability De uh, Development Goals, uh, which all of you are uh, very, very familiar. But sustainability also in the ESA context is very well enshrined in our strategy called Agenda 2025. And if you remember the document, I'm sure you all have read it very carefully, uh, it is really focusing on many aspects on sustainability parameters and very concrete actions that we want to initiate. Uh, we have, uh, for example, identified that uh, we would like to reduce the carbon footprint, not we would like, that we are committed to reduce the carbon footprint by 46.2% until 2030. 
in line fully with the IPCC guidelines. And this is something that is also finding its way into the budgetary proposals where uh, decarbonization and uh, uh, carbon uh, footprint are playing an, a very important role. I've also, right after I became DG of ESA, uh, installed uh, an officer, a, a responsible uh, officer for sustainability and climate change. Uh, he is reporting uh, directly to our strategy department and uh, making sure that we are across, across the board, across all the activities are focusing on sustain, sustainability. You have also noticed uh, that we have uh, created some accelerators. One of them is called uh, Space for Green Future. Uh, Space for Green Future is actually really looking how space can help in the decarbonization of the economy, uh, in becoming carbon neutral, and how we can help countries uh, to, uh, in the process of doing so. And uh, some examples we are doing is we are creating information factories uh, where uh, sustainability and uh, carbon reduction uh, is the main topic. Uh, we have now selected a, a first country where we want to, on the, on the basis of the whole country, use the information and help decision makers based on space data and other information to model what decisions need to be taken in order to reduce the carbon footprint according to the goals that they have set in that country, uh, in this particular case by 2040. Which means looking into traffic, uh, into agriculture, uh, into energy and many aspects that are obviously related and see, of course, in some cases where space provides critical information, what could be done in order to really uh, meet, uh, meet these targets. So this is extremely um, important extremely uh, critical. Also within the uh, accelerator on the green future, we uh, have a proposal to develop new sensors, uh, quantum gravimetry, uh, for those of you who are in the technical domain, uh, as a technology where you can monitor with high precision, much higher than with today's technology, uh, the water content underground, uh, not only above ground, but underground. And I don't need to explain how important the knowledge of this is in order to uh, really manage properly your resources, agriculture, drinking water, and many other aspects which are related to it also, including, by the way, uh, security, because shortage of water always leads to conflicts and uh, security threats. So the decarbonization challenge is, uh, is crucial. Of course, we have a fleet of uh, satellites that uh, measures other parameters related to sustainability, carbon dioxide being, of course, the, the primary uh, greenhouse gas uh, which uh, causes our climate warming. Uh, we have uh, missions within the Copernicus program that do exactly that. But one always has to be reminded that uh, carbon is not only the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it is really the carbon cycle, as we call it, with uh, carbon uh, on the surface of uh, the land, in the oceans, and in the atmosphere. And this carbon cycle, you need to know many parameters in order to really well understand uh, what needs to be done. So this uh, accelerator will provide actionable information, uh, which will help us to form the baseline for effective European adaptation strategies to support the green transition, and, as I said, to really become uh, carbon neutral uh, by mid-century, as many countries have, have uh, declared this to being a primary goal. In Copernicus, uh, we have many satellites that are uh, focusing on sustainability parameters. Sentinel-1, uh, looking at uh, extreme weather events, uh, earthquakes, disasters, uh, marine environment uh, through the radar observations. Uh, Sentinel-2, in particular, on agriculture, forest fires, uh, climate change parameters at large. Sentinel-3 being the most precise uh, measurements of sea level height. Uh, sea level height being, of course, an indicator uh, of climate change, but also being extremely critical for cities around coastlines in order to, uh, first of all, understand the level of sea level rise and protect against uh, the increases uh, of uh, sea level rise. But altogether, and Copernicus is certainly a prime example of how we address the issue of uh, sustainability very hands-on, the very important aspect of Copernicus is that we are providing this data free and open to the whole community worldwide. And this is extremely important that the technology which we have developed in Europe, the sensors which we have developed, are providing huge amounts of data, 300 terabytes of data are disseminated from the Copernicus uh, ground segment uh, in Frascati to the, world, uh, to, the, to the world and to every user who wants to use this data. And this is really crucial. And I know that some of you on the panel have spoken, uh, for, uh, for example, with uh, uh, Pilar from uh, Colombia, they are using uh, 
Copernicus data in their, uh, in their assessment of uh, land use and uh, their assessment of sustainability parameters. And I think this is a good example of how this uh, data really enter into, into society. If I may say one, probably the most single parameter success criteria of Copernicus is the free and open data policy, because this is what people at the end need to use and want to use. And therefore, I really, I'm very, really very happy that we can also offer something to the service of uh, humankind, uh, to the whole planet, by providing this information uh, with um, uh, very high accuracy. We also have very strong projects in Africa, uh, so-called uh, EO for Africa, uh, the TIGER initiative, but also the work with the World Bank, uh, where we have, uh, uh, together with the World Bank, create, created an alliance uh, where we have uh, a trust fund, where the World Bank funding is matched with uh, funding from ESA member states in order to carry out projects in Africa in particular, but uh, in developing uh, countries on the topics of uh, water and food security as primary uh, themes uh, in order to, uh, in order to uh, help it through the Global Development Assistance Program, uh, the various countries using space in their daily life. Of course, we have also, uh, we are using sat uh, satellite communications and uh, navigation in combination with Earth observation for all these uh, sustain sustainability measures, uh, as you know, by better understanding uh, traffic uh, flows in the air, but also on ground, uh, we can uh, reduce the carbon footprint. There are predictions that uh, between 10 to 15 percent of the uh, carbon footprint of uh, of uh, ground-based traffic could be reduced by better management, uh, better flows of traffic, uh, which requires navigation and telecommunication as, a, as an infrastructure. These are some of the examples where ESA is really putting a focus, uh, but uh, as you know, ESA is very strong in international partnerships and cooperation. Uh, this is uh, certainly something where we would like uh, sustainability to be a key driving factor, and therefore I'm really happy that we can contribute to the wider theme of sustainability. And thank you very much uh, for organizing this panel and uh, for the debate which will come. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Joseph, for this um, uh, inspiring um, uh, keynote address. And I hope it will also accelerate the internal decisions uh, in the member states for to put the money on the table at the next ministerial. That's it. That's uh, with, because that, I think it's the, the key words are uh, accelerators and inspirators. That's exactly it. Good. Then now we go to the to the rounds of questions. And um, I will start here with the left with uh, with Christian and um, uh, Christian. In the Norwegian Space Agency is focusing on two important um, projects, if I believe, let's say, which is the Blue Justice uh, covering illegal fisheries, but also the NIFI talking about the tropical uh, train forest uh, monitoring. Um, can you explain, let's say, what are, what, is the, what are the reasons behind selecting these particular programs? Certainly. Thank you, Peter. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Joseph, for taking your time in a busy schedule. And um, uh, thank you to all the panel members uh, being present here. I mean, it shows the importance of this uh, topic. Uh, Joseph touched on some important issues here, uh, namely to uh, uh, grasp the ambition on the political level and see how we can, through all these various uh, means and measures that we can uh, supply through the uh, Earth observation programs, provide real tangible data for, for um, uh, fighting uh, climate change and uh, supporting the sus sustainability goals. Uh, these particular programs uh, are examples of uh, the ambitions of the Norwegian government, which is, uh, the, our government is, is very focused on the sustainability goals and we have uh, uh, the, the highest level of attention from our, our politicians. Um, uh, starting with the NICFI program, this is an example of a PPP program where um, the uh, space industry is working together with our Ministry of Climate and Environment um, in terms of uh, monitoring uh, deforestation and providing this data to third world countries around the equator and the, in, in the tropical rainforest areas. And this is uh, simply a, a way of, of, um, of the government realizing its ambition through financing. This is actually a, a fairly large program, uh, 45 million euros for, for buying data from commercial operators like Planet and, uh, and with, uh, with local industry and providing this for, for the, these countries. Uh, likewise, with the Blue Justice Program, this has just been announced by our uh, Ministry of Fishery 
uh, fishery is a huge uh, industry in Norway, and uh, the, the, we have been tasked together with the um, national coastal authorities uh, to use the AIS data for tracking maritime traffic in order to develop that into uh, a tool for also uh, fighting illegal fishery. So we are taking uh, the investments that we've done in our infrastructure and is part of the continued task on developing this. Uh, this is also part of our ambitions through the CM22 uh, and, and using that for, for fighting those uh, uh, problems. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Christian. Now we go to, to Pilar. And um, let's say with Pilar, there's always an, uh, a surprise because there Pilar will talk about the initiation of the Green Shot project and let's say being dressed completely in green, which is not a coincidence, I'm sure. Let's say, could you tell us a little bit more about the Green Shot project in Colombia? Good morning, everyone. Uh, yes, and uh, GreenSat it's the sustainability program of a Colombian space agency, and uh, it's a, a platform for uh, give a monitoring system about uh, agriculture, about uh, um, water bodies, about uh, qualifying of the of the air about the deforestation, and the, the program has an, uh, two chapters. The first one is uh, the, the platform for analyze of uh, this uh, data, data that come from uh, public um, um, programs like uh, Copernicus, and uh, our um, information too. Uh, we are doing all designing and uh, process for built CubeSats. And the objective is that we can give all information from the public private data with other partners that we have, uh, with like uh, Maxar, like HEAD. And uh, the objective is that we can really have a real, in real time information, not just from Colombia. The objective is that participate um, all Andean community. We implemented uh, that program from uh, this year in uh, Ecuador, Peru, Venezuela, Bolivia, and uh, Colombia. So I think that um, it's really important for Colombia and um, I think that for the planet. Uh, use the, the satellite data that now exist and uh, for us it's, it's really, really important because this class of platforms on the cloud uh, can, uh, with that information, we can really uh, monitor all that are happening in our countries. Um, and uh, by that reason, uh, our GreenSat project really it's a uh, great goal for Colombia and for the, for the public and the private sector too. Thank you very much, uh, um, Pilar. Then we go to um, Rodrigo. Um, we have Copernicus, we have got um, uh, Galileo, uh, but now there are synergies with the combined use of these uh, two programs. And could you give some of the uh, best examples, uh, please? Yes, so uh, good morning. And first of all, uh, Christian, thank you very much for uh, organizing this, this very important um, uh, this, this very important talk this morning. Um, I mean, at, at, at USPA, we have been, well, already in the past, uh, when we were GSA, we, we have been uh, very focused um, on ensuring the market uptake of the use space program and the use space program components. And our focus was, uh, of course, uh, primarily on the navigation elements, uh, Galileo and Egnos. And, and there, I think, uh, with all the work that was done, um, both with the chipset manufacturers, but also with the application developers, um, we have reached a very significant number uh, of receivers that are able of receiving Galileo. So today we have um, around 3 billion uh, receivers around the world that can receive Galileo. This includes, of course, um, all modern smartphones, but it does also include not only that, it includes cars. It's Galileo is present uh, in many, many different uh, in many, many different areas. And this is, of course, the first element for utilization is making sure that the receivers are ready for that. On the other hand, also Copernicus uh, has an established uh, use base. I think it is wildly used, of course, by institutions in Europe and not only beyond Europe. Joseph has mentioned it um, before. Uh, the, 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 the data policy of Copernicus allows uh, the utilization of this very valuable data all around the world. Now we are entering into a new phase. And this new phase we are entering is how can we use these systems together? How can we create synergies um, between precise positioning uh, of Galileo and of EGNOS, by the way, uh, for European coverage and the imagery of Copernicus? How can we create synergies between navigation from space and uh, Earth observation? And we are starting to see the first results. So we have created um, through the, 
the Horizon Europe program and through the Cassini initiative of the Commission, we have created a number of calls where we are asking industry to come forward and propose their ideas on how to use them uh, in combination. Very there's a very wide range of applications. For example, and I think probably one of the best uh, usages that you can do of, this, uh, of these two technologies combined in agriculture. Today, uh, precise navigation is in agriculture. 95% of all the tractors sold in Europe are equipped with EGNOS, but also Copernicus data uh, is uh, used, for example, uh, for monitoring water levels, uh, for monitoring crop growth. Bringing those together, uh, we can not only boost the utilization and boost the, use the usage and the usability uh, of those systems, but it also helps us on achieving sustainability, uh, sustainability targets because for example we allow a better use of water a better use of land and soil a reduction on the use of pesticides and I think these are quite good and quite clear examples of how bringing different space technologies together and we can answer then concrete needs of specific market segments like agriculture I could go on on transport city management etc etc uh, very fascinating uh, development, this new synergies between these two flagship programs of Europe. Then we go to Africa. Uh, let's see what we've seen, Val. In the African continent is a large uh, increase in the number of um, um, space agencies. And what do you think are the main challenges uh, for further growth and uh, cooperation inside uh, the African continent? Now, firstly, thank you, Peter, for convening, pulling us together for this GNF and to Chris, Christian for the, the support. Um, I think there's four key challenges that I wanted to just pick up on. The first is the full political support. Uh, yes, you're finding a whole plethora of African space agencies kind of mushrooming, but I have a fear that a lot of them is a Me Too strategy rather than setting up an agency to drive the strategic priorities of the country. So we need to get that full political support for a national space program when it's actually established. And forums like this in terms of highlighting the benefits of space uh, is gonna be very critical. The second one is the financial constraints. And obviously when that happens, you have to make strategic choices in terms of what, what do you actually do in, in, in the country. But I think the third one is the human capital and the expertise you need scientists, engineers to actually be working. And I think I mentioned this the other day, a lot of the reactions that we're seeing from Africa is build a one new cube set and then declare that you're a spacefaring country, which is far from reality. And that leads to the fourth one, which is the technology readiness level and the infrastructure base. At the, and I think the way we can address that to cooperation is tech transfer, knowledge transfer. But that's addressing the what aspect. I think the how aspect becomes even more critical. Uh, we have established an African Space Agency, and that's meant to coordinate uh, across the African continent. But I think it also requires a sort of a self-organization on the continent in terms of a bottom-up approach. Because we do see international collaboration happening in Africa, but you have 55 countries. And if you're not careful, there's a risk that you have 55 disparate conversations that pulls Africa apart. So you need to have a, an intervention where you start to converge activities in Africa. I mean, there's some issues that are just transcends national boundaries, water, climate, health. Um, and so you need to have a, a collective approach rather than a disparate approach. So I think that's more or less what needs to happen in Africa. Thank you. Yep. Thank you very much, uh, Velm. Asami, let's say that uh, we are working together in the, the Clyden Committee. Let's say you are uh, the chair of this, uh, of this committee and you promote a lot the use of space technology and data for developing nations and emerging countries. Um, could you tell us a little bit what are the main priorities of uh, Clyden for the coming years? Yes, thank you, Peter, and um, thank you, all of you, for coming here today, all of the speakers, and particularly Peter and Christian uh, for organizing this, and Joseph for being here. Um, and as chair of CLIADEN, the Committee for Liaison with International Organizations and Developing Nations, so your key takeaway today is to say CLIADEN 10 times and remember what it stands for. <laughs> um, but no, I'm just joking. Um, for, um, um, today, I would like to um, 
well, um, uh, tell you as my message, just two key points that I think uh, today we want to bring back is that, well, IAF committees, we work for IAF. What does IAF do at IAC is we um, have this place for exchange of knowledge. So we are all here to exchange our knowledge. We all have these committees for that, that work year round. Clyden is one of that. Also the Earth Observation Committee is one of that, and the GEO Subcommittee under that is one of that. We also work with the um, ACDCEC, um, the Committee for Developing Nations, um, also Emerging Communities. Um, and uh, that's also where we work on these subjects of sustainability and how how to have um, our technologies, space technologies, utilized um, in the societal and economic man, um, matters um, on ground also for uh, all nations. And so um, this uh, exchange of knowledge that we want to achieve here at IAC, that's the first point. The second point is, um, well, at IAC, I was just talking in a bilateral meeting yesterday with a U US colleague that uh, we hear space people, inviting space people, talking to all these space people. Um, uh, and that's great. We have, um, what, 10,000 space people here now. Um, and that's great, but we do have to talk to um, people outside of our community. That's my second point. So that's what we've been doing for a very, very long time um, as a community in sustainability issues. And what Clyden also takes as priority to work through international organizations to talk with developing nations. Um, just example would be to talk with UNFCCC for um, our carbon um, emissions, carbon observations observations, how we can use those data, um, Ramsar Convention, um, and also IPCC also now has in its guidelines to use satellite data, and this is a big change over this decade. So um, just a few examples, but I think uh, with also UN USA um, that is closely collaborating with us, and we had a great workshop just prior to IAC, um, this IAC inviting 200 people, um, and it was a very enthusiastic uh, gathering. So so all of these activities, I wanted to stress that IAF is making happen and we want to push forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Masambi. Let's see, you're absolutely right. Let's, there was a fantastic, um, fantastic event in, uh, in Quito in the, month of, uh, in the month of May, very well organized. And during that conference, we saw that there were a lot of uh, promising developments in Latin America. Uh, and, uh, and also, uh, one of the things which was discussed, discussed there was the creation of the Latin American and the Caribbean the Space Agency. And this brings me to my question to Yolanda. Let's say that's uh, to which extent and how far can the uh, EU uh, support these developments inside uh, Latin America and the Caribbean? Thank you, Peter, and thanks to Christian as well for organizing this and, of course, for inviting also the European Commission to be part of this. Um, indeed, it's a very promising development because it shows that space is also gaining momentum in Latin America and Caribbean countries, which, of course, we very much welcome. Um, we see there, uh, in particular, the opportunity as well for uh, local research and development, for entrepreneurship, innovation, uh, which will not only actually boost uh, the space sector, so the um, uh, the medium, or mid and, and upstream and downstream sector, but as well it will uh, bring a whole new ecosystem with academia and, and universities. And you will have spillover effects as well into other sectors. Uh, so this is very pro uh, promising uh, locally. For the European Union, of course, it's also a good development to see indeed uh, that uh, space is gaining momentum there. Now, as you know, that the EU space program is, is not a, a one of uh, activity, but is something which we do together with the partners in crime, uh, EUSPA, uh, of course, represented here with uh, by Rodrigo, but also the European Space Agency, uh, which is absolutely essential for building a space uh, program uh, for the European Union. So we are used to having a, uh, what I would say, a multi-partner governance. Uh, we have a lot of experience there, and there we could uh, maybe also support uh, this new agency uh, with uh, the activities and the developments. And in addition to that, as also uh, uh, Joseph already mentioned, uh, the data
data of Copernicus are uh, free and open. Also the service of course of Galileo is, is free and available uh, around the world. So these kind of activities uh, could be used as well by this new agency uh, to develop indeed uh, uh, locally and, and use it uh, to, to uh, actually offer more opportunities uh, for the eco uh, economies as well. Um, thank you. Thank you. Now we're going to the second round of questions and taking into account the, uh, let the, 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 the time which uh, keeps on ticking, let's say that um, I would ask uh, all the panel members, let's say, to have perhaps a somewhat uh, shorter uh, reply, let's say, to the second round of questions. And to start with, with the Norwegian industry, uh, academia and research centers. Christian, let's say, how can they contribute toward making available the satellite data uh, and services for emerging countries? Uh, what are the ideas? Um, the approach that we will take is that we are currently working under national funds for extracting national services based on, on uh, data from the EU space programs, in particular on the Copernicus. Uh, this has proven uh, quite efficient that we are engaging our national institutes and, we're, uh, and the national directorates who's actually presenting their needs and, and drawing on both the, um, the Copernicus services that is developed under the commission and by the local needs uh, where we develop our national uh, 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 say national end user uh, programs in order for landslides, for uh, ice monitoring and all those things that are relevant for the Arctic region. So um, the, the bottom line here, uh, how is this applicable for the uh, sustainable, sustainability action for emerging countries is drawing on that experience and I, I want and we have the ambition now to develop under uh, bilateral agreements, uh, drawing on our experience and, and using that in uh, bilateral means to, to support the emerging countries. Talking about an emerging country, let's say this is uh, quite clearly the case with, uh, with, with Colombia. And there, uh, let's say I've been in contact with, uh, with Pilar, let's say on this EU action on the, the global action on the space initiative. And, um, and you, let's say your agency, Pilar, has indicated a great interest uh, in this. And uh, can you explain why this uh, satellite data and services is so important for Colombia? The, the, the satellite data, it's very important in, to Colombia because in the, for, for our context, uh, Colombia is the second country with more biodiversity in the world. And our area, it's very huge. We have uh, 1.4 million, 1 million kilometers uh, to monitoring. So if it's not with satellite data, we can't do it with other form that now exist. Um, and in that sense, it's very important because our idea in GreenSat is not just to uh, monitoring the, the, the rural areas, it's monitoring the cadaster uh, multipurpose too. Uh, the cities that are very important, that are huge in Colombia. And uh, of course, that the, the program for Global Action are, are very important, has an, a great information uh, about uh, all results that we can monitor, but we can take this information for education too. Uh, for, for Colombian Space Agency, the education is fundamental. And the objective is that we can share this information in the education platforms open to the all public and, in, and the, the public entities too. And I think that. Uh, by that reason, we have uh, so interest in, in that, this program, in, um, and we have uh, we are working for for apply all this um, process in our GreenSat platform. And I don't know if in that moment uh, you can put the video or it's later. Okay, later. Oh. Ah, good. This is our vacation for. Is that sound? No, but yes, but that no, don't work. <laughs> okay, 30 seconds. No sound? 30 seconds. Okay, and, and this is a, a, a context about what is Colombia, where we are. Yeah, how is our uh, two oceans and how we have really high uh, natural resources to involve and to protect. So thank you, Peter. Thank you, um, Pilar. Now there is an, an, an really an excellent report, uh, Rodrigo. Let's say the market report which you've published in January 2022. 
Let's see, this one report that really details the 70 market segments for which there is a huge potential. Um, which markets, seg they're all important, of course, without any doubt, but which, in which market segment do you see the major growth? Yeah, uh, first of all, thank you, Peter, for mentioning the, our market report, something that we publish every, every two years. And this year we published the first one that was actually dedicated both to navigation and earth observation. Um, and we looked a little bit at, uh, if you want, the entire economy, the entire society, um, where uh, space is already bringing something and where it can bring um, even more. And I think here is key, uh, indeed, this element of transforming a lot of data, and we are getting a lot of data from Copernicus, a lot of data from Galileo, transforming this data into information and information that is uh, that is uh, um, usable and for for this it is extremely important to listen to the users um, we have established a very good experience with what we call mark uh, user consultations the user consultation platform will have the next one in two weeks from now uh, within the um, use space week that we are organizing uh, together with the with the European Commission and uh, when it comes uh, to these market consultations is as, as Masami was mentioning is to go out of our little bubble and talk to the people that have needs and see how those needs can be answered by the market. Um, looking in terms of trends of growth, I would highlight two uh, where I see uh, really a lot of uh, uh, potential for growth in addition to the tra traditional ones as transport, etc. One, um, uh, definitely uh, energy management. Uh, energy uh, is an important uh, area and in the energy management space can do quite a lot. From the synchronization of grids to the inspection of solar panels to the prediction of wind flows for um, uh, wind, solar, uh, wind uh, production plants, etc. So energy management, very important area for space. Um, uh, the second one, and by the way, it came to me a little bit as a surprise, but I find it quite interesting, is the banking and insurance sector. Also, the banking and insurance sec sector is showing a huge interest for uh, space data, not only, for example, for synchronization of, of financial tr uh, transactions, but also, for example, on calculation of insurance premium and evaluation of areas uh, through uh, Earth observation imagery. So I would I'll hi highlight these two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's quite, quite surprising, the second, uh, the second market uh, the growth uh, the potential. Now, Val, so you've mentioned in your first uh, reply, let's say, that there are four main challenges for the African continent, and you mentioned also the human capital um, um, education space, uh, they're in uh, a key role. Let's say you've got now uh, your role of a chancellor of the Interna International Space University. Um, so which kind of experiences can you bring along, let's say, with the, in the perspective from the African continent? Okay, now thanks for that, Peter. Um, just a bit of reality on the African continent. Um, we do have a, what is called a youth bulge. More than 50% of the population are under 35 years of age. But the reality is that there's a significant unemployment. So you have a latent workforce. And how do you capture that? And I think there's two things that essentially needs to happen, if, especially in the space sector. We need to stimulate this, the space ecosystem. And when I talk about space ecosystems, it's those products and services that needs to be uh, used to address the socio-economic environmental challenges. But to do that, you need the human capital, you need the infrastructure, you need an industry base, and then you need to leverage on international cooperation. But the second element to get that going is that you need very strong leadership and commitment as well. And so when we talk about human capital, it's around the technical expertise, the leadership, and the business acumen. I'll just give you two very quick examples. Um, so there's an initiative that uh, we are working on with TENSA, which is the Technology Higher Education Network of South Africa. There's about a dozen or so universities of technology, and we're looking at what sort of curriculum do we need to educate the next space workforce, okay? knowing that there's going to be a demand in the system in terms of uh, absorptive factors. And so that's an example of how, from a human capital development point of view, we respond to the system. The second one is obviously the ISU. You have the Space Studies program, you have the Masters in Space Studies, and that's been now for four decades. And those are very strong programs. And we've seen a, a huge pull factor from the African continent for students to actually attend the ISU programs as well. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, let's say in that context, of course, the uh, the space studies program takes place, uh, let's say, in Brazil next year. Next year is in Brazil. That's uh, right. Let's say so. This is very interesting. That I hope there will be a lot of students coming from uh, the African continent and from the uh, Latin American uh, region. 
Um, Masami, let's say you are director of the JAXA Washington office, and let's be, we're working together already a, a, few, uh, a few months, a few years, and let's say you are, let's say JAXA has got many initiatives, let's say, to support uh, developing nations and emerging countries. Um, could you explain, elaborate a little bit more on this? Yes, you ask a space um, agency rep to talk about missions, I can go on forever, um, but <laughs> I can talk about them like I breathe, but I will just come up with some uh, um, highlights uh, that might be good for all the audience to take back this time. Um, so as an organization, JAXA this year adopted um, some guidelines on sustainable development goals. We did present this at UN COPU, so you can see how um, as an organization we take this sustainability as an issue uh, very um, important at heart. And uh, also in this um, line of discussion, we work with an um, organization called JICA. Uh, so they're not space, they are international development. A lot of you might know them. We work with them on um, two uh, representative uh, missions called, one is for um, monitoring deforestation called JJ Fast um, in the tropics. Another is for monitoring rainfall. Um, it's a global map, GS map. And, uh, uh, these uh, we do work with JICA to work with many many company uh, countries um, and if you would like to join us uh, I would welcome to talk to you later um, with the US we are joining the Earth Systems Observatory now that NASA is leading uh, by uh, contributing um, our satellite which would be a follow-on of our gro uh, global precipitation mission so all of that and the dashboard between ESA, JAXA, NASA um, that we started for um, having uh, the world to see what we're doing for Earth observation applications for societal um, problems. Um, this is being um, uh, a very good success, so I urge you to go to see Earth Observation Dashboard, um, and uh, that is just part of what we're doing. Um, I would like to further um, uh, cooperate with all of you in this room on these missions. Thank you. Thank you, Masami. Um, the last question is for Yolanda, and let's say, and there we see that there has been an, a major uh, paradigm change in the industrial landscape, going from the from the big players, let's say, to to a myriad of uh, SMEs and uh, excellent uh, startups initiatives. Um, how does the Commission see this, uh, see this change, and to which extent can the emerging countries and the developing nations benefit from these um, uh, from these developments? Thank you, Peter. Um, now, of course, we see this as something very positive. Uh, I think we all know that, uh, at least uh, for Europe, uh, the backbone of our economy are the SMEs. Um, um, so also any development in that respect in the space sector is, is uh, welcomed. Um, what we did see uh, already a couple of years is that it is for SMEs and startups and very innovative um, uh, uh, players not very easy to enter the market and actually generate uh, enough uh, money. So this is one of the reasons why the Commission uh, decided to set up uh, the Cassini program, which is something which we execute together with uh, the team of Rodrigo, uh, where we have one billion indeed for startups in the space sector. But in order also uh, to indeed have emerging countries benefit uh, um, uh, from um, uh, certain activities, um, this is one of the reasons reasons why we have in the global action for the EU space program to, uh, to which you already referred a, a business coaching component to indeed uh, link uh, the various businesses from uh, on the one hand the European side but then also with potential businesses uh, in the emerging uh, countries uh, to show the potential of the EU space program and how they can benefit indeed from the data and the services uh, which we deliver and then apply it uh, for their local economy. Economies. Okay, let's say now, uh, thank you very much, uh, Yolanda, and uh, all the panel members for the, uh, the two rounds of questions. And now it's the time for the audience. So if we can project again, let's say the, the QR codes, uh, let's say I think which has been used, let's say by, uh, by different, uh, different uh, GNFs and sessions. You can go then to the three polls. And uh, what I would like uh, you to do is to look at the, at the questions, and which will be projected now on the screen. Let's say so we can go then, perhaps we can go then to the first question. And 
there you see, let's say the, let's say the four, uh, the four potential answers. Uh, as we are running a bit out of time, it would be very nice if you could uh, look at these questions and give your quick answer, and then the results will be displayed immediately. Could we also see the uh, the question on the the back uh, the back screens over here, please? Yep. As everybody. Given their inputs, and can we now show the results? Okay, that's, that's quite clear and a uh, winner. And I think that Josef and Rodrigo has already mentioned, let's say that this is uh, very important, that there should be this uh, customized data available uh, free of charge. So this uh, really undermines uh, that uh, has been very convincing statements made by the panel in this, uh, in this respect. Um, yeah. So there, how many? There were four, 34 answers. Okay, 41%. Yeah. Okay, let's then we go to the second question. Ah, money is always the key, the key issue. <laughs> At this. I don't know, let's see whether everybody has already completed the, uh, the questionnaire. Yes. But it's obvious that shortage of public uh, funding is considered as the as the biggest uh, as the biggest challenge because of course it's uh, there are many other um, topics uh, let's which require um, public funds and that um, yeah, so very good 39 answers so more replies 42 replies okay no a clear winner then we go to the to the third question. Yeah. Uh, so there, it's a bit more, um, bit more balanced, but still the, uh, and that was what Rodrigo already said at the um, at his uh, intervention, that uh, agriculture, uh, precision farming, etc. And let's say there's um, that's a key, a key sector which uh, could be supported by the combined use of uh, Galileo and uh, and uh, and Copernicus. A bit strange that the data on the climate services is the is the lowest one. Okay, that's uh, this is it. So thank you very much. Let's say for your contribution. Um, the, um, uh, the the final results will also be available at an um, at an uh, at a later stage when let's say when the uh, when the, uh, the the program is put on uh, online by the uh, IEF. So now we come to the last part, and let's say I think that we have want some time, which are the key takeaways, let's say, from, uh, from this session. Um, uh, Christian, your key takeaway. Um, I think the key takeaway is the complexity of the issue. I mean, it's not only a matter of establishing the space infrastructure and satellite and, and sensors and, and gathering the data. It's uh, talked about uh, the, the need for combined use of various sources of data, uh, education, uh, organization, how you collaborate, uh, leadership, governance, the need of SMEs. I mean, this just shows that this is a, a huge issue and it, uh, it, we need to attack all of those in parallel in order to make this work. Thank you. Pilar. I think that uh, more about uh, all this data that we can found, really we need to process this data and to share how all people can uh, 
know, understand, have uh, more uh, knowledge about what they can uh, do with all this uh, information. And I think that uh, it's cooperation, international cooperation. It's very important for build a really space ecosystem. Space ecosystem, yes, you're absolutely right. Rodrigo. Yeah, I mean, also from my side. First, I'm, I'm very happy by seeing the answer and uh, Yolanda. I think on the EU side, we are doing the right thing because the yes. providing data for free um, is, is also appreciated by this audience. I think it's appreciated everywhere in, the, um, uh, everywhere in the world. But I also focus on what was number two, the second one, which is it's fine to give data, but how to transform that data into information that can be used. And I think this is key because we can do a lot of data. We can give tera, uh, terabytes of data uh, a lot of Galileo signals, but if people don't know how to use it, um, then there is a uh, then there is an issue. So it really the, to 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 help to transform data um, uh, into usable information, and there also uh, at union level we are uh, we are we are doing a number of things, and I think of course we, we can always do more. I think this is um, uh, this is very important because when you go to the insurance company, for example, or to the bank, uh, the insurance company, the bank will tell you I don't. I, I don't really care. I have a problem to solve, and I need this problem to be solved, and I need information on which I can act. I don't need terabytes of, 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 of pictures or uh, signals. I need data on which I can act. Vau? Thanks, Peter. Just to uh, advocate a policy strategy response to the questions, uh, responses, food security became was t the top priority. So in terms of the shortage of public funding, you don't motivate for a space program, you motivate for the fact that space is an enabler to address a food security problem. And then in terms, of, I think Rodrigo has addressed it, it's using the free data that's accessible, but it's not data, it's information. How do you transform data into information? And I think you need sustainable ecosystems and a very strong leadership to pull through all of these interventions. Thanks. Yep, very, very clear. Thank you. Masami. Yes, uh, again, to talk to about all these societal problems to different communities. And in that line, I'm uh, looking very much forward to the GLOC, um, the global conference next year um, in Norway. Um, so to exactly do that. Yeah, thank you. And the final words for uh, Yolanda? Oh, this is very scary, of course. Uh, no, I think from, from today and from the panel, for me, it's absolutely cooperation what is needed uh, in the space sector, indeed, uh, to make sure that, uh, that what we have on offer around the world, because we are not the only partner, of course, that this is indeed used uh, um, for local communities as well, because that's the idea behind it. And maybe to refer to uh, the State of the Union of the President of the Commission last week, uh, clearly I identifying that uh, for uh, Europe it will be Latin America indeed as, as one of the top priorities and reaching out as well. So this links also to the establishment of the agency and hope that indeed we can uh, offer our uh, cooperation uh, to move on. Yeah. Thank you. Well, this must be very good news for um, for Latin America and Pilar, I think in, in particular. Let's say this uh, statement by uh, Ursula von Leiden. So th thank you very much, let's say, for this. And now the last uh, closing remarks are for Christian. Well, uh, again, thank you, everyone, for taking part in this, uh, uh, in this uh, GNF panel. Uh, it shows that uh, this is all about networking. Uh, that's what these uh, conferences are for. Uh, this started as a pleasant conversation in the uh, Quito conference now in May on uh, the um, uh, uh, global conference for emerging countries. And this is what spurred the idea of playing this forward uh, by the initiative of Peter into a panel drawing on all the various resources. And we've seen the complexity of all these issues and why it's important to, to keep discussing all of this together. So um, personally, uh, me and my team, we're drawing on this uh, experience and, and the uh, enthusiasm that we, we um, feel about this, uh, playing forward to our conference next May, uh, the GLOC, the Global Conference on Climate Change next year. Um, and uh, this will also be on 
on, on the, uh, the topic of uh, what's called fire and, uh, fire and ice, because fire is on the tropical region and the heating and the droughts and everything, the forest fires that we're seeing as part of the climate change. And uh, the ice is on the ra radical changes we're seeing in the Arctic, on Svalbard and the de-icing and melting of glaciers and everything. Uh, I mean, this is really, really very essential topics. So. Um, uh, the ambition for this conference is that uh, it will serve as uh, uh, to demonstrate space as a toolbox for political action on climate. I think this is the background that we need to move forward, and uh, I welcome you all in Oslo next May. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you, Christian. Thank, uh, thanks to all the panel members, and thanks uh, to the audience. Um, to have participated to this very interesting uh, GNF session. And hope to see everybody again in Oslo, the beautiful city of Oslo, in May 2023. Okay. Thank you.